You never fully forgot it. You know, you, you still have little bits and pieces throughout your life usually, but especially as children, anything that happens that is um, really traumatic, um, the, the painful parts, you, you tend to forget the entirety of what happened and you forget so much of it that, you know, it, for example, I, I remember, you know, being dunked under, but but I never remembered, you know, anything else. I just, it wasn't enough for me to think that it was uh, um, not normal. You know, I, I remembered that my whole life, but I didn't remember actually, you know, um, passing out and, and the pain that went along with it. And so you have just enough usually either in your subconscious or conscious mind that when something triggers it uh, throughout life you remember it but you don't remember it fully until one day it just kind of explodes in your face um <clears throat> and that's just kind of what you know ptsd flashbacks do and and when it happens it's like you're there it's like you're reliving it it's bizarre it's like making up for the fact that you didn't remember it fully by remembering it so intensely that it feel it almost feels like you're there again sometimes when i have these memories i i temporarily forget where i am um i mean i have a, a general knowing you know but temporarily i get absorbed in it um and then I think to myself, well, how could I have possibly forgotten that? It makes absolutely no fucking sense how, how I could have forgotten all of this. Um, and to this day, yes, it's been explained to me about how that happens with post-traumatic stress, but I still don't understand it. And I would have rather remembered because if I, if I had a choice, you know, I didn't choose to forget. If I had a choice, you know, I would have rather remembered instead of this instinctual thing taking over, you know, because really, is it instinct? Because really, to me, instinct would be to remember so that, so that you can protect yourself, so that you know, you know, all that's going on, so that you're not blind to it. Um, part of, I think, why, you know, you start to forget is because you're told that it's normal. And... If you are told that enough times, you might actually think, especially as a child, that it's normal and you might just discount it as, you know, not as important as it should be. Um, it's just something that you go through. And I did as a child. I thought that this was 100% normal. It was only when I, you know, remembered it later on as an adult thinking none of that was normal none of it um <clears throat> so i'm going to start out with the water one um so my mother usually typically is the one that gives me a bath but <clears throat> and i was young probably three to four i was really young so um maybe five but i you know i i could pretty much give myself a bath but she was still there with me and um you know when it was time to wash my hair she would tell me to to go under the water and she would try to hold me there until i couldn't breathe and then i'd panic and then i'd try to get up and then my father would come in and he would be like, you need to stay under the water. Your hair needs to be clean. You need to wash your hair and you need to comply. If you would just comply. I remember he kept saying over and over, if you would just comply, this would be done a lot faster. And, you know, I kept panicking because I'd run out of air and I'd choke on the water. Um, you know, and my mother kept saying you know i wouldn't stay under and he said you know you just have to hold her there and she said i can't 
And he just said, well, you know, I'll do it from now on. Um, so he's the one that would wash my hair from now on. And what would happen would be that, you know, initially I'd panic and then my lungs would completely fill with water. And when that happens, if you've ever had a, a near drowning or, you know, drowning experience where, where it, you're underwater long enough for your lungs fully fill with water, it feels just like breathing air, except you don't get any oxygen. So at that point, you're not coughing anymore, but you, you know, obviously still feel like you're going to pass out. And then eventually you do pass out. So what will happen would be that I'd pass out and then I'd wake up, um, which wasn't normal either. Um, it was, I think my spirit guardians, well, I know my spirit guardians saving me, saving my life. Um, time and time again, they would save my life in situations just like this. And I'd wake up and I'd, you know, sit up and, and cough and panic again and wonder why I, I couldn't get air in. And it was because the water was blocking it and I didn't know that. So I just keep coughing and panicking. And that would make my father come because he would hear it. He would hear the commotion and he would do it again. He would try and push me under again and tell me to stay under. Um, and he kept saying that I was making it a lot more difficult than it had to be because I wouldn't stay under. He would yell at me and he would, you know, force me down and then he would wait until you know, I passed out and then I'd wake up and then I'd be like, oh no, he's still there. And I'd try to fight him and then he'd, he'd hold me down again. And then I'd wake up a third time and then he'd be gone. And then I'd finally, you know, get out, I'd cough and the entire thing happened, all, it, it would make him come back. And so I eventually like played dead. I played dead like I was passed out, but I wasn't. And then I tried to very, very um, you know, uh, as quietly as I could cough it out of my lungs. Uh, but the problem was that, um, you know, it, that only worked one time because then he realized that, you know, it wasn't enough time. He realized that, um, I mean, yes, technically my lungs, I was underneath just long enough for my lungs to, to fill with water. Yes. But, you know, it was at that cutoff point, right before you pass, right before you had pass out. So he realized that I was going unconscious too soon. And he knew that I was faking it. And so then at that point, that was the night that he just kept staying on top of me and he wouldn't leave, he wouldn't leave, he wouldn't leave. And it was just over and over and over again. And it felt like a, a, a prison of hell. I mean, um, over and over and over again, it can't get out of the surface to breathe. And um, eventually I wake up and nobody's there and I just chance it. I don't care if he hears me. I don't care if I make noise. You know, I, I can't breathe and I feel like I'm going to pass out again and I'll have to do this before I pass out again. So, you know, I finally sit up, cough, and then he gets really angry because after all that time, I should be dead, you know, four times, five times over by now. But how long he held me in there, it was a very long time. And I don't know how long it was, you know, it could have been a substantial amount of time before I woke up, I don't know. But it wasn't natural, it wasn't normal, like I should not have survived that. And definitely it's not normal to forcibly hold a child underwater for that long to wash their hair, and I, I totally thought it was normal. I totally thought that that's how you washed a child's hair. I mean, because that's what they did to me. Um, the fire one is a little bit more simplistic. Um, it's pouring gasoline and it smells horrid all around this room and, and, that I'm in. And he says, I'm, I'm going to do a magic trick. Watch this. And I keep saying, it stinks, it stinks. And then he pours it on top of my head and then it, and all over my back and my pants and my feet and just everything. Um, and it really is so strong that 
you know, I, I'm choking on it almost. Like it's, it's making me cough. It's so strong. Um, and then he, he lights it up, you know, with, he lights the stuff on the ground up, but he doesn't light me up. He just lights the stuff on the ground, or not the ground, but the floor of the house up. Um, and then he leaves. He just leaves, shuts the door and leaves. Um, and I try to run through the fire and I get some of the fire on me. And ironically in school, I, I, we were really young, it was probably first grade, kindergarten, I don't know. This corny stop, drop and roll shit that I literally just learned in school that saved my life. You know, you think that's really corny, but it literally stop, drop and roll saved my fucking life. And so I tried to open, I, I did like this to try and get it off my hair. And I tried to open the door. It's so much, you know, stuff in there that it, I couldn't breathe. And so I'm trying to open the door. Door is locked. I can't open it. And so then I go to the window and literally I'd only opened one window like a couple times in my life. And I was having difficulty figuring out how to open a fucking window. But I finally, finally got it open. And it was a one story, so I just kind of jumped out. And I, I still had stuff, you know, on, on me, places, little bits and places on me. Because I didn't have time to just roll it inside. I didn't have time. I, I had to get out of there. Uh, just, you know, you couldn't breathe in there. Um, so I had to, you know row after I got outside. So basically the, the grass, um, I remember the grass being a little wet, I think like, like dew, like morning dew or something kind of, but it wasn't morning. It was, well, I don't know what time it was, but anyway, um, I just was kept rowing in the grass and I thought this is not going to work. This is not going to work. And it, and it worked. It actually worked. It saved my my life so thank you firemen for coming to our school <laughs> and being corny because I, I remembered that and it saved my life it really did um so anyway um i remember getting in the car and then asking me how did how did you how did you get out how did you you're not supposed to get out how did you get which how did you just stay how did you get out you know and i and i told them how i got out and you know, their neighbor comes and said, do you know your house is on fire? Like as they're pulling out of the driveway and, and leaving, do you know your house is on fire? And they, they told me to get in only because they knew I was a witness. And they knew that I, I couldn't tell anybody what happened if they took me with them. So we go in the back door of the hotel, they make me stay in the car until they get a room so that they won't smell the gasoline on me. And that's about the end of that memory. I don't remember anything after that. The neighbours saw it. They saw it. This is what pisses me off. So many times there are witnesses. People see things. People call police. And they don't fucking follow up on things. For one reason or another. Whether it's they are just ignorant. Or whether they're actually in on something. And they're trying to cover something up. From some kind of underground thing. I don't know. But you know. We need to change the way that we follow up on situations, the tips, calls that come into the police. Because had people followed up just once on just one of these things that somebody witnessed, you know, and had they actually investigated the way they should have, then I believe that, you know, my family would not be free. They would be in, in prison for life and I wouldn't have had to live with them my entire life. And people just like me have stories just like me that died, that didn't live, that can't tell their stories. So I feel like, you know, because I survived this, I have to make people aware of it. If it was an isolated event, I wouldn't be doing this. I wouldn't be doing it if it was just me. But it's not. They belong to a very evil Abrahamic 1500 style religious cult. They have a bunch of people doing shit underground, taking occupations, such as police officers, autopsists, to cover their shit up. I'm a survivor. I hope that somebody will listen and believe me. If I expose this, people know this shit's out there, maybe they'll finally start to do a fuck about it.